We have an amazing class for you guys today. We're hearing from Nyland McBain, and she is coming on to talk about the history of the women's voting movement. It is such a great class for election week. Nyland is an incredible teacher. She's also an author and a TEDx speaker. And this is a great class you could even bring your kids on too if they wanna learn more about the history of the women's voting movement. It's perfect timing for the election. We hope you guys learn a lot from this class and love it. Hi, my name is Nyland McBain. I am the co-founder and CEO of Better Days 2020. We are a nonprofit that popularizes women's history for elementary school grades. And I'm standing in front of some of the materials that we have designed to help elementary school students become familiar with the women's suffrage movement, specifically in this year, 2020. So I'm here to give an eight minute class on the women's suffrage movement. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the movement, about its history, and um, I'm going to explain why it's important that we're celebrating this movement in this year of 2020. So first of all, the word suffrage means the right to vote. We can also say, we could also use the word enfranchisement if someone is enfranchised or, or the process of being enfranchised means that they have the right to vote. So in 1848, uh, we have the traditional start of the women's suffrage movement. It was in uh, upstate New York, in Seneca Falls, New York, in 1848, that Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton got together, and they decided that there were a lot of things that they wanted to change about being oh, an American woman at that time. But the most radical idea that they had was to let women participate in voting. They also wanted to give women the right to own property, to have custody of their children, to have opportunities for work and education. But they really saw voting eventually, as the movement started to grow, as the way that they could accomplish all of that, all of those other demands uh, by passing laws and legislation and by electing leaders who would put women's needs first. And so this movement gained steam. It was very slow at first, but by the end of the 19th century, uh, there were Western territories and states in the United States that started letting their women vote. In fact, this woman behind me here, Sarah Young, was the first woman to vote in the United States under an equal suffrage law. She cast her ballot on February 14th, 1870 in Salt Lake City, Utah. And so we actually have just completed a large um, number of celebrations marking the 150th anniversary of that first female vote. The movement, of course, was led uh, primarily, we know the name of Susan B. Anthony first and foremost. She joined the movement a little bit after its founding, but has become the household name for the suffrage movement in the United States. She traveled the country, she crisscrossed on trains back and forth, she spoke for decades um, advocating for women to have the opportunity to participate in public life and in civic life. And so we celebrate her with, with some of our materials as well. Her group and her movement was able to have success in those early Western states, but then eventually in 1920, the United States added to its constitution the 19th Amendment. It's also called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment or the Suffrage Amendment. And so this amendment is turning 100 this year. In 1920, the 19th Amendment restrict, lifted restrictions on voting rights so that gender was no longer a restriction for voting. Previously, only men had been allowed to vote and that had been codified in the 14th and 15th Amendments. And so the 19th Amendment was needed to lift the restrictions of gender off of voting participation. So that's what the amendment did. And so we say in shorthand that it gave women the right to vote and it did do that. But it's important to recognize that basically what it did was it gave female citizens the opportunity not to, to no longer be barred from voting. And this is an important distinction because what it means is that for people of color, for women of, from communities uh, that had been previously my, uh, marginalized, they still were not able to vote either because they were not citizens or because there were um, limitations at the polls, such as poll taxes and literacy taxes, which still did not let them participate in civic life. And so more legislation was needed. This woman behind me, Zakala Shah, was a Dakota Sioux woman who was really instrumental in passing the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act. 
There was also an Asian Citizenship Act necessary, and also the Voting Rights Act of 1965 uh, was really was necessary to allow African American people, both men and women, the opportunity to freely participate in political elections. And so this year, 2020, we also celebrate the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. And so no story about the suffrage movement in the United States is complete unless we take it through that entire history and look not only at 1920, 19th Amendment, but all of the legislation that was needed after that. One of the interesting things about this story is that it's continuing. We think of Susan B. Anthony, we think of Seneca Falls in 1848, we might think of the 19th Amendment and say, wow, that was 100 years ago, that feels a long time ago. But with all of this additional 20th century legislation, we can see that the conversation had to continue and it continues today. The idea of who is a citizen, who has the right to have a voice in our political process, um, how are people getting access to voting? How are their votes being are their votes being counted properly? All of those are questions that we are wrestling with right now, even specifically this year in a presidential election, that are really top of mind. Another reason this story is so important is because the suffrage movement was never just about voting. The suffrage movement was the platform through which American women entered the public sphere. It was the first time where they wrote where they spoke publicly to mixed gender audiences, where they advocated for themselves, where they published newspapers and sent them across the country, where they traveled on speaking engagements, where they really entered the public domain. Prior to the suffrage movement, women were traditionally responsible for the domestic sphere and men were responsible for the public conversation, the public sphere. And so the suffrage movement really was women's crossing of that threshold into the public sphere. So anytime we speak publicly today, anytime you have a job or speak to mixed gender company or own property or, or anything like that, we have the suffragists to thank for that. And we take that too much for granted. Lastly, another reason this story is so important is because history is messy. And that's an important lesson for us today because oftentimes we think that big dramatic things that we do should just happen and we are disappointed and frustrated that we have to struggle for them and that there's a lot of conflict involved. But this movement, this 70 plus year movement, shows us that even women, when they're working towards a similar goal, don't always get along. There was a lot of confrontation. There were a lot of conflicting opinions among the leaders of the suffrage movement as to how they should accomplish their goals, what methods and tactics and strategies they should use. And we can draw comfort from knowing that the women of the past and the people of, of the past in our country worked really hard to wrestle through all of these issues to get us where we are today. And we can live up to their legacy by remembering them, by working hard to improve the world that we have today as well, and by never taking our rights for granted, because when we do take our rights for granted, we often backslide and lose them. So we need to continue with this fight today, live up to their legacy, and honor their heritage. Thank you. Wasn't that a great class from Nylan? We hope you guys loved her teaching and the way that she presented the information as much as we did. We're going to link her profile and her company's profile in our stories today so you can go check out her pages if you want to learn more. We hope it got you ready for election week and we hope um, that it provides kind of a civil atmosphere to the upcoming elections that it will hopefully instill that sense of history in us and help us understand how important it is to get out there and vote. So as always, thank you guys for watching our eight minute classes. If you love the class, will you go leave a comment or a like for our speaker on the post of the class? And um, yeah, we're so glad you guys were able to watch today. Thanks.